teachers and students. Today we're going to talk about the Catapult Project. This is an extremely easy STEM lesson to teach with your students, but it's also very engaging for them and they learn a lot from it. And it is a true STEM lesson. It incorporates science, technology, engineering, and math woven together into a comprehensive lesson. And as I said, it's very easy. Each pair of students will need one kit. In fact, this baggie here contains an entire class set. This is everything I need to do the catapult lesson with a classroom. And this can work with primary students, clear up through high school students, as I'll show you as we progress through this. Inside the kit that the students work with are these materials. There's a plastic spoon. There are 10 wooden sticks. I use tongue depressors. Six rubber bands and a binder clip, sometimes called a bulldog clip. On one of the sticks, I've glued a bottle cap that can be used if they wish as their launch platform. So the students have to think about how to design a catapult. Now there are different ways you can measure the effectiveness of this. So one of the things I do is I talk to the students and say, how do you know if a catapult is good? What are the qualities you want in a catapult? And they say things like, you want long distance. Well, yes, in real life, a catapult would need to be far as possible away from the castle that you're trying to assault. And they have the kids research catapults and when they were used and how they were made. So there's a research component to this. Now, in addition to distance, another important factor is direction. I don't want a catapult that launches backwards or sideways or something like that. Accuracy is also important. So we discuss these factors ahead of time. And I call this the research phase of the STEM instructional cycle. Step two is the design phase. And if I'm working with younger students, I simply have them sketch how their catapult's going to be built out of these materials. And it can be very simple for young students. As students get older, I'm gonna want them to label parts. With my middle school students, sometimes they had to make a diagram that another team would build. So their diagram had to really be precise. The third stage of the cycle is the build stage, and this is where we actually build the catapult. Step four is testing, where you measure how well it's working. You try it out, see what happens. Then we go to the evaluation stage, and we make decisions about whether or not that did what we wanted. And finally, we go back to the improvement stage. And we go back through the cycle over and over as many times as we want until we, get the, the, until we achieve the effects that we want. This is called the STEM instructional cycle. I don't give my students any suggestions or ideas about how to build their catapults. That's something they'll discuss with their partner. That's one of the reasons I put them in teams, and it also cuts down on the amount of supplies that I need. The more dialogue and language I encourage, the better the students are going to think deeply about this project. One of the first things I do, once the students understand the instructions and have done their research, as I pass out these kits to each pair and I have them inventory their kit to make sure it has everything it's supposed to have. The 10 sticks, the six rubber bands, the binder clip, the spoon, those kinds of things. That way I don't have to check each kit. When we're done with this activity and everything's being put away for the following year, I have them inventory them again so that what goes into the baggie should be correct for next year's students. And I keep a bag of spare parts in my kit. So if a student says, I broke a rubber band, then they can come up and get a new one. Now I've designed a couple of catapults here, two different styles that I'll show you. Notice that in neither of these did I use all the parts. This one simply uses the wooden sticks as the tension for launching the object. This one over here uses the binder clip and the elasticity of that in order to launch. And the armature on this one is two sticks long instead of one stick. As far as the projectiles, you can use a pom-pom, a ping pong ball, or something of your own choice. Just be cautious about safety. I would not suggest using grenades with the actual catapult. Catapults work based on tension forces. One of the things my students sometimes do is they'll put the projectile into the catapult and then they'll flip it with their hands like that. And I tell them that's not how a catapult works. The soldiers didn't pick up the catapult and throw it. They have to use the tension force in the materials. So in this case, the tension force is in the wood, as I said, and in this one, it's in the binder clip. There are two types of tension forces, and both are shown in this lab. One is called an elastic force. 
That's a stretching force. That's what we see in rubber band. As we stretch these and use them to attach, the resistance becomes greater as I stretch it. That's an elastic force. The other kind is a compression force where you push like a diving board or certain springs. So as I push down, it wants to return to its former position. Now, sometimes students will use this in place of the wooden sticks as their launcher. So if I wanted to, I could attach this out here and put the projectile into the spoon. So they get to design this any way they want, and they can go back and try to redesign it. If it doesn't prove as effective as they want, they can modify it. That's part of the importance of a STEM-based lesson. You may find that with primary students, kindergarten, first grade, and so on, students need some guidance in designing a catapult. But once it comes time to test them, probably you're going to measure this on distance away from the catapult. And in kindergarten, you'll probably use non-standard units like paper clips or something like that, a paper clip chain. And as kids get older, you can use more standardized measurement. You could also put a target on the floor and have them see how many times they could land in it. It could become a counting exercise. You could also have them take 10 shots at that target and count how many went in and how many didn't and record that as a 10 pair on a 10 frame. So that's a way to incorporate the mathematics into this. As students get older in elementary grades, the measurements can become more precise. You can incorporate fractions like seven and a half feet or 3.2 meters. In fact, measuring this in centimeters means the students will be working with whole numbers, such as it went 227 centimeters. But if you change your measurement to meters, that becomes 2.27, and you've made the measurement system more advanced for students that are practicing decimals. You could also incorporate how far they are away from a specific target. So in that case, the smaller the number, the better. Or you could say it's distance minus how far you miss the target by. So if it goes 10 feet, but it missed the target by one foot, then you're doing subtraction. And again, the subtraction could involve fractions. It could involve decimals if you wish. As students get into the upper elementary grades, I'm gonna ask them to take more attempts with this and combine that data. Uh, what was the range of the data for your 10 tries? What was the uh, mean or the median or the mode of your data. I might have them graph the results. So these are things that you can do to bring the mathematics of the grade level into the lesson. By middle school, all measurements should be done in the metric system because it's the international measurement system used by all scientists. I could also have more advanced scoring systems that involve using negative numbers that my students might need to practice with. Older students will also be asked to experiment with variables. How does a one stick armature compare to a two stick armature? How does the tension force of the wood compare to the tension force of the binder clip? Those are things I want them to consider. I want them to modify and adapt their designs and see what changing one variable does to the outcome. And they're gonna be taking a lot more data in the older grades. Now, statistically, you shouldn't start drawing data until you have about 30 samples. If I just launch this once and it goes three feet, does that mean it will always go three feet? What if I launch it 10 times? Now I'm starting to get more data. And by 30, my students can find the mean, median, mode, range. They can make a box plot or a scatter plot or something like that of their data. These are grade level appropriate mathematics for this. And by high school, we can get into even more advanced mathematics. I could ask my students to analyze the parabolic arc that the projectile travels because that's a quadratic relationship. And in algebra, they talk about quadratics. Suppose we have a projectile that travels six meters and has a maximum height of four meters. That would mean the x-intercepts would be at zero, zero and six, zero. The axis of symmetry would be in between those two at x equals three. So the vertex is at the point three, four. The general form of the quadratic is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Substituting the point 6, 0, we get this equation. 0 equals a times 6 squared plus b times 6 plus 0. And substituting the point 3, 4, we get 4 equals a times 3 squared plus b times 3 equals 0. We now have a system of equations. 
Solving these gives us a value of a is equal to negative 4 ninths and b is equal to 8 thirds. So the equation for that parabola is y equals negative 4 ninths x squared plus 8 thirds x. So as you can see, there's a lot in this lesson. It's very easy to set up, it's very easy to do, but the rigor that the students get out of it is very impressive. They're getting the science of these forces that are at work in this physics. They're doing mathematics that's grade level appropriate. They're doing research, which is the technology piece, or maybe they're analyzing that parabolic arc using online software. And they're engineering the most effective catapult that they can do. So try this with your students. I think they'll really get a lot out of it, and you'll find how easy it is to teach a STEM-based lesson.